I love the word providence. Providence reminds me of the power of God. The power of God to do anything, to change any circumstance so that it blesses us and benefits us and also makes us a blessing and a benefit to others. I was singing that song, To Abide, reminds me so much, and thank you for reading it, Corey. Uh, John chapter 15, we abide in the Lord, why? We worship the Lord, why? We read our Bibles, why? Why do we do all of those things? So that we could bear much fruit, spiritual fruit, fruit that lasts, fruit that remains, fruit of bringing other people in to the kingdom of God, fruit that we get to rejoice with forever in heaven. The providence of God in Acts chapter 23 is what I'm gonna be sharing with you today. I love this definition of providence. It goes like this. It is the sovereign control of God over and ordering natural circumstances to do God's will. Let me say it again. Sovereign control, providence is God's sovereign control where he orders the natural circumstances in order that his will would be accomplished. Uh, there's a great song on the radio right now and it's uh, been playing for months and I hope they keep playing it. There's just some songs that just, it's called The Same God. You're the same God and, and the, it goes like this. You're the same God of Jacob, the same God of Moses, the same God of David, and Mary, and I wanna add, and Paul. And the same God who worked in their lives, who ordered the natural events in such a way that he imposed his will so that God's glory is accomplished, God's will is accomplished, and our eternal good and blessings are accomplished. If you've been with us over the last few years, we've been studying the book of Acts, and today we're gonna look at verses uh, 23 through 35, and so Paul is on a journey, right? Paul, in this point in time in his life, I think he's at probably at the, one of the lowest times in his life. I mean, he is not on a mountain, he's not on the summit where he has this vista view and everything is great. No, he's in the pit. He's not in the palace, all right? He's in the valley. He's not on the mountain. He's in a tough way. How did he get there? Well, he's been misunderstood. He's been falsely accused. He has been beaten. He has been arrested. He has been rejected by his own countrymen. And now he finds himself incarcerated in a Roman prison. Not only that, <clears throat> we noticed last week that there is this hideous, evil plot that has been designed to take Paul out. The plot has been developed by the religious Jewish zealots who are ready to take Paul out because Paul is boldly preaching the good news of the gospel of Christ. And when that good news of light penetrates the darkness, the darkness does not take it lying down. And so they have hatched this plot and we saw it developed. And last week we saw how it was actually discovered. The plot was discovered when Paul's nephew, Paul's sister's son, who in the world is this? I've never seen this guy in the Bible. I didn't even know Paul had a sister, much less a sister, son, a nephew. But God in his providence, out of nowhere, he orchestrates an event that can only be attributed to the hand, the power, the sovereignty of God. He puts this little guy into the prison with Paul and says, hey, Paul, hey, uncle, how's it going? I gotta tell you something. They're gonna kill you. They got an idea. They won't... They want the commander to release you, and as you make your way down to the Sanhedrin, uh, Uncle, you listening? There are 40 of them. 40 of them are gonna pounce on you, and they're gonna take out the Romans who are defending you, and then they're gonna take your life. So Paul says, well, young man, good to see you too. Thanks for coming in and checking on your uncle. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go tell the commander. So the centurion takes the young lad, walks him into the presence of none other than Claudius Lysias, the commander of the garrison of the thousand troops of Rome that have been stationed at Jerusalem to make sure that the Jews behave because they're always uprising. They're always getting excited about something, it seems, especially on their holidays. And so he's there. The young lad comes in and he goes, sir, I'm telling you, there's a plot and it, 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 is, it is for real. These people tomorrow 
They want you to take Paul back down to the Sanhedrin. They say they're going to examine him. But they're not going to examine him at the Sanhedrin. He's not even going to make it to the Sanhedrin. Here's what they're going to do. They're going to pounce on him, and they're going to kill him and some of your soldiers. And that's where we pick up the text today, all right? So if you have your mind open and your heart ready, we're going to go to the Bible. And here's what we're going to do, church. I hope you're ready for this. Mm-hmm. Excited. I'm going to read the whole passage, 23 through 35. Now watch this. I am going to resist the temptation to make a comment on every verse. Okay, I'm just going to read it. This is so hard for me just to read the Word of God. Then I will come back. I will make comments, and we will explain. We will illustrate. We will apply the text. But first of all, we're going to read the Bible. All right, so I need you to do something for me. I already stood up once and greeted people I didn't even know. What are you asking me to do now? I need you to stand to your feet. All right, everybody, stand up loud and proud. You stand to your feet. Hey, I see you online standing. Good job. Way to get away from that sofa, you know? You got your coffee in your hand? Come on, standing up. I'm gonna read God's Word. In the honor of God's Word, the reverence of God's Word, it goes something like this. 23, 23 Now he called for two centurions. Claudius Lysia called for two centurions, saying, Prepare 200 soldiers and 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night and provide mounts to set Paul on and bring him safely to Felix the governor. He wrote a letter in the following manner, Claudius Lysias to the most excellent governor, Felix. Greetings. This man... Paul was seized by the Jews, and he was about to be killed by them. Coming with the troops, I rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman. Mm, Resist, resist, resist. And when I wanted to know the reason they accused him, I brought him before their council. Now, I found out that he was accused concerning questions of their law, but had nothing charged against him deserving of death or chains. And when it was told me, it was told me that the Jews lay in wait for the man. I sent him immediately to you. And I also commanded these accusers to state before you the charges against him, farewell. Then the soldiers, as they were commanded, they took Paul and they brought him by night to Antipatris. The next day, they left the horsemen to go on with him and returned to the barracks. Now, when they came to Caesarea and they had delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. And when the governor, Felix, had read it, the letter from Claudius, he asked what province he, Paul, was from. And when he understood that it was from Cilicia, he said to him, I will hear you when your accusers have also come. And he commanded him, Paul, to be kept in Herod's praetorium. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. It is truth. It is life. We don't want to just read it and ignore it. We want to read it. We want to preach it, teach it, apply it, illustrate it, honor it. Do the very, very best we can today, Lord, to read your word, study it, And God, we pray, Holy Spirit, you would be with us. Lord, I'm praying today. I know, Lord, I know there are hearts that are in the pit. God, they are heavy today. And Lord, I'm praying for them that you would lift them up. You would strengthen them by the same providential hand, the sovereign, omnipotent hand, God, you, that delivered Paul, that you would deliver them. Lord, I'm praying for our people that are on a mountain. God, there are some people that are soaring with the eagles today. Life is good They are witnessing, they are loving you, they're loving their neighbors, they're prosperous and blessed, and we rejoice with them. God, your word says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, so we do, and we're asking for your help, God. I am asking for your help. Lord, I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to speak to me, speak through me very clearly, God. There would be no confusion, that it would just be clear as a crystal stream. That, God, you would speak to our hearts, 
Speak to our minds. In Jesus' name, I pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Now we're going to go through the verses. You ready? Verse 23, Claudius Lysias, he's a good political leader, at least at this point. He commands two centurions to make provisions, ample preparation to get Paul, watch this, from Jerusalem in the south, 65 miles north to Caesarea by the sea, all right? They're going to go 65 miles. They, they've only got 1,000 troops in Jerusalem. He's going to take almost 500, watch this, 500, 470 troops to transport Paul out of the jail in the Antonio Fortress in Jerusalem they're going to make their way north to Caesarea by the sea. You say, why are they doing all this? Because of the plot. The plot has been discovered. Now the plot is going to be overturned. Claudius Lysias is a good commander at this point, okay? So he's, he's organized it. He's ready. One writer said this, Claudius Lysias orders the infantry, the cavalry, and the armed soldiers to get the job done. He says at the third hour of the night, verse 23, that's 9 p.m. Isn't that interesting? He gets the message. He's not going to wait until morning. In the morning, he's supposed to be transporting Paul out of the Antonio Fortress down into the temple precinct, but the plot is there. They're ready to kill him. They're ready to pounce on him. So here's what he does. He said, let's get half of our troops and let's get, uh, you know, 400 on their feet 70 mounted on the cavalry. Let's put Paul on one of those. And I dare those people or anybody to come against this man. I'm almost laughing as I read that. Here you have Rome at its finest protecting the man that they despise and they don't think he's even fit to live. But I'm telling you, God told Paul, he said, Paul, listen to me. Jesus comes in the room and he says, you're not gonna die here in Jerusalem. Just watch this, Paul. Just watch what I'm about to do. The same God that delivered Paul can deliver you. He has not lost one ounce of his power in fact, he's so powerful, he's also incredibly creative. He says, Paul, watch this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to amass about 500 troops, and you're going to make your way up to crazy Felix. And when you get to Felix, it's going to look pretty rough there too, but don't worry about it because I made you a promise, Paul. You're not going to die in Jerusalem. You're not going to die in Caesarea. In fact, you're going to make your way to Rome. I love what one writer, Chuck Swindoll, he says this, remember God's promise? You must witness it, Rome. This is just part of that divine plan. What a comforting story. Despite the odds stacked against him, Paul was never removed from God's protective hand. And neither are you. Are you feeling alone, mistreated, misunderstood, forsaken? Remember this story, this true account. God's at work. He's there. He's working behind the scenes. He will work it out. He does have a plan. Just when you're convinced the bottom is about to drop out from under you, behold, God steps in and he lifts you to safety. That's our God. The same yesterday, today, and forever. In our staff meeting on Monday, I had a word for our team. And I shared this with our pastors and our directors. And I want to share it with you, our people here at Great Hills, and those of you that are watching and listening online. It's Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. What a word of promise from God. Woo, this will bless you. If you came today, maybe, maybe you didn't sprint into church today. Maybe you limped. Maybe you said, man, that hour of sleep, it about took me out, Pastor. I tell you, I'm so tired. I'm so sleepy, but I'm here. Praise God you're here, all right? Listen to this word. Fear not. I am, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. God says, I will 
help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's verse 23. You ready for 24? Sure you are. Here we go, verse 24. Paul will travel to Caesarea, the Roman headquarters in Judea. It is a beautiful city on the Mediterranean Sea. Some of you went with me a few years ago, and we were there. And we saw the theater there. We saw the Hippodrome where they raced the chariots years ago. And it is a beautiful city, Caesarea. Herod the Great built it from 22 B.C. to 9 B.C. Took him a few years. Why did he call it Caesarea? That's so beautiful. It just rolls right off the tongue. He did it in honor of anybody? Caesar. That's right. So Caesarea by the sea was built by Herod the Great in 22 B.C., and he did it in honor of the emperor of Rome, the Caesar, okay? Felix, who is this guy in your Bible? Look at verse 24. Who is Felix? Thank you for asking me. Felix is the governor for Rome in all of Judea. He is Claudius Lysias' boss, That's why Claudius Lysias addresses the letter. Basically, oh, most noble governor Felix, I have this letter to send to you, okay? So who is this guy? Well, he has a brother named Pallas. Pallas works for the emperor of Rome, uh, of of the whole Roman Empire, and he lives in Rome, and Pallas is over all the civil authority in Rome. He is very well connected. He puts a good word in for his brother, Felix. And he says, "Uh, Emperor, would you appoint my blood brother, Felix, to rule all over Judea? And I know it's a precarious spot because that also includes Jerusalem, all right? We we know there's lots going on in Jerusalem. And so Felix gets the job. Felix's wife is the granddaughter of none other than Cleopatra. How about that? Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Felix is well connected. In your Bible, you may just want to make a couple notes. Felix has a brother named Paulus. Paulus is well connected to the emperor. And Felix's granddaughter is none other than, or Felix's wife is the granddaughter of Cleopatra and Mark Antony. Felix is large and in charge. However, Tacitus, the Roman historian, said he has the power of a king but the mind of a slave. He ain't very, he is not smart. That's, that's what they said about him. And so he is there, he's Felix, he's in control, and here comes Paul into his presence. Verse 25, if you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. If you're bored out of your mind, don't say anything. Here we go, verse 25. Lysias writes a letter to Felix, and Luke records the, the letter. This is brilliant. Remember, Luke wrote the book of Acts. Luke is a medical doctor and a first-rate historian. That's why you have so many details in the book of Acts, the book of Luke. Some argue even he wrote the book of Hebrews. Okay? So he writes this letter. In verse 27, Lysias, liar, liar, pants on fire. He did not tell the truth. Did anybody catch it? In verse 27, he makes himself look good in the eyes of the governor. He did not go down and rescue Paul when he found out that he was a Roman citizen. That's what he said he did. That's not what happened. Y'all remember what happened? Paul was being beaten and he, he sees the turmoil and he knows that if this thing erupts into violence and it, and it, and it causes so much concern, it reaches the ears of Rome, then he's going to be in trouble. So he swiftly moves in with his troops, and they extract Paul out of of the very volatile, precarious situation. They get Paul out, and they put him in prison, and they said, beat this guy. Beat him within an inch of his life, because I know he's guilty, and you know, they didn't know about, you know, you're proven until you're proven innocent. You know, you're guilty until you're proven innocent. No, they just said, he's guilty. Just beat him. And Paul said, hello, hold on just a second. I'm a Roman. And they're like, whoa, you mean you're a Roman? He said, yes, I'm a Roman. 
And that means I have to get a fair trial. That means you're not supposed to lay a hand on me or you could lose your job, sir, and and you could even lose your life. That's what really happened. But that's not what he says. He says, when I found out he was a Roman, then I went in and I extracted him from the crazies. Verse 28, true, he took Paul to the Sanhedrin and we noticed that last week. Verse 29, The pagan Roman authorities recognized, this is really interesting to me, y'all. This is all still in the context of the letter that Claudius Lysias, the the, the commander of the troops in Jerusalem, has sent to Felix, who's the governor, large in charge person, right? So it's interesting to me because the pagan Romans, they figured out what the religious Jews refused to admit, they said, we tried him. And what we found out about this guy named Paul, we, he has done nothing deserving of death. I'm not really sure why they hate the guy so much because I think it has something to do with their laws, you know, and their religion. I, I really don't know. All I know, they're about to kill this guy, okay? He has done nothing worthy of death. Let me, let me, let me stop here for just a second just, and just share this with you. And please be careful. I'm not just talking about radical Islam out there. I'm talking about Baptist in here. Be careful of somebody who thinks they're doing God a favor by punishing you. Be careful of religious people who think they're doing God a favor by punishing you, slandering you, libeling you, or whatever. Well, God told me to do this, or God told me to do that. No, the devil probably told you to do that. Because if it's not honoring to Christ, it's not building your brother and your sister up. I'm telling you, I fear religious people more than anybody. I do. I mean, I'm down there at South by Southwest. They ain't nobody religious down there. I'm just telling you. I mean, it's it's wild. It's crazy down there. And people looking at you, what's up? This one guy, he goes, so let me get this right. I was like, "Uh uh-oh, here he comes. I said, yeah, we're inviting you to the South by Southwest event, this free barbecue from Stubbs. We got Lecrae's going to be in the house. We got the CEO of Intel, Gesslinger. He's going to be giving his story. And they're like, really? So let me get this right. This is one of those Jesus things. And I was like, what do I say, Lord? Do I say yes? Or say? I said, yes, it is. He said, that's cool. That's what he did. He said, that's cool. I thought, I thought he was going to hit me. You know, he said, no, that's not cool. No, religious people hit you. I've, I've come close to getting beaten up as a pastor. I'm walking away from some of y'all. Y'all looking at me like that. No, I, and Ashley's my witness. Had she not stepped in, I know this one guy's going to take me out. I mean, there's not a whole lot to take out, right? So good religious Baptist. Why? Because I made a decision he didn't agree with. And so... Beware of people who are religious. They think God, they're doing God a favor. Take it out on you. Be careful, okay? Verse 30, Lysias concludes his informative, succinct, and mostly accurate letter to Felix. Verse 31, here it comes. 470 Roman soldiers bring Paul to the halfway point to Caesarea. The name of the city is Antipatris. Did y'all see it in verse 31? You say, Brother Danny, help me, please. You're killing me. Are we going to stop every time the Bible mentions somebody new? (laughs) Yeah. Isn't that cool? Hey, we say it's the Word of God. Do we really believe it's the Word of God? We ought to honor it. We ought to study it and let it guide us. Let it be our guide today. Antipatris. I love this. Herod the Great built Antipatris, which is 35 miles north of Jerusalem, okay? And they're going about the halfway point, a little more than the halfway point because they're making their way to Caesarea by the sea. Antipatris just happened to be, well, his father's name was Antipater. Okay, you get it? You with me? So he names the whole city after his father. That's Herod the Great. They make it to 35 miles and they say, okay, wait a minute. They make it to 35 miles the next day. So that means they had a forced march all night. Paul didn't. Paul's on top of the the steed, the animal. 
the horse, okay? And he's probably bouncing around, about to fall asleep. And I, I just read that, and I was like, that's amazing that those 400 foot soldiers marched all night. They did not sleep. Look, for you and me to go 35 miles all night into the next day, that's pretty serious. And he makes it up to halfway point, and they said, okay, I think we're out of the reach of the Jews now. The people's trying to kill him, okay? Religious people are gonna do God a favor, and they're gonna kill this guy. That's what they think. So we've extracted him, and now we're gonna move him on up to Caesarea to get him to Felix. And here's what happens. The 400 turn around, and they go back to Jerusalem, but the 70 on the Calvary, they keep walking. They keep moving their way up to Caesarea. And then verse 33, this part just really grabbed my heart. It says, and they also presented Paul. That's such a touching moment to me. He is exhausted, no doubt. He is weary. He's been up all night. But I think Paul is at peace. He knows it matters not what happens to him in Caesarea because God made a promise that he would make it to Rome. Look, if you got a promise from God, if you got a word from God, don't fear anybody. Don't fear anything. If God has spoken to you and you know it's the Lord, it wasn't the pizza you ate the night before, it wasn't some crazy dream or something bizarre, if you really believe that God has given you a word, God has given you a promise, then move forward. Verse 34 and 35, and we're done. Felix questioned Paul, and he learned from him he was from Cilicia. Hey, you're in my jurisdiction, not only in this area, but he has, he's, I'm telling you, Felix is large and in charge. He says, okay, when your accusers come, I will listen to them, I will listen to you, and then I will make my decision. And that's the end of chapter 23 of the book of Acts. Now, I just want to make a couple statements uh, by way of application. And I want, Lord, please help me to apply what we have read and what we have studied. There's no plot that can stand against God's man or God's woman when God has promised them all will be well. We've seen a sinister plot developed against Paul. We have witnessed how the plot was discovered. And now finally, we have seen how the plot was defeated. I got a couple of scriptures I want to read to you. Um, you may be in a tough way like Paul. You may be needing to hear a word from God. And so I want to read it to you. God is our refuge and God is our strength. He is a very present help in trouble. Psalm 43, verse 2. Therefore, we will not fear. We're not going to fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, and though the mountains shake with its swelling salah, look, I'm not going to fear, the psalmist said. Paul's sitting on top of that horse going, hello, what's going on? What's happening in Caesarea? I'm not fearful. I'm not worried because the word of God that he gave to me is much stronger than the circumstances in which I find myself. Verse 7 of 1 Peter 5, casting all your care upon him because God cares for you. One writer says this, are you in a tight place? Don't fear. In fact, you are right where God wants you. Furthermore, he will see that you arrive precisely where he wants you to be. If he is able to stir up 472 earthly bodyguards to get Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea safely and securely, surely he will have no trouble getting you wherever safely and securely. After all, how many angels are there? I heard a story this past week, and I'm going to share it with you. It's bizarre. It's miraculous. It almost made me cry when I heard it. But I trust the source. I trust Pastor Robert Morris. He's the pastor there at Gateway Church in Dallas-Fort Worth. 100,000 people, 10 campuses. And that's where my wife's uh, sister goes to church. 
she would be my sister-in-law. And Michelle, in fact, she worked on the staff at that church. She worked in the special needs children's department for many years on staff. She and her husband Jay are members there and their children. I was listening to Pastor Robert Morris on a podcast this week. He told the story of traveling to a Presbyterian church, okay, and he was speaking. I just saw, I think it was two nights ago, Robert Morris was the guest of the big rodeo up in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, he came out and gave the prayer before all the crowd and the rodeo crowd. Anyhow, he's in, in a Presbyterian church, and he felt the Lord tell him something. He felt the Lord impress him to say to this lady who is an elderly lady in the church, by the way, I love having, having elderly ladies and men in the church. The trend in churches today is don't have old people in your church. Have young people and thrive and arrive and we all in our 20s and we all are just cool to the bone. I wanna tell you something. That's not a New Testament church. When you are multi-generational, you got the old and you got the almost old getting close to 60 old and you got the youngins in the house and, and, and there's a good opportunity that they're going to not get along with each other. They're not going to like the same music. They're not going to dress the same way. They're not going to like this. They're not going to like that. That's why churches say, goodness gracious, old people, y'all going to worship the Lord at 9 o'clock? And you wild and crazy youngins, y'all going to worship the Lord at 11 o'clock? And the two never meet. I don't think that's God's will. I think it's God's will that the old and the young get together and work it out. Work it out. Come now. Come on. That's why we have so much fussing in churches like ours. <laughs> we in this together, y'all. And however God leads us in the future, multiple campuses, I'm not going to change this. The old and the young are going to be together if it kills us, amen. So here we go. God help me. Please help me. He said, ma'am, I believe the Lord has given me a word of prophecy, and I'm going to say this to you. I believe that you will be a mighty woman of God, and you're going to teach other women how to pray for their unbelieving husbands. I'm maybe way off here. I hope I heard the Lord right. But you, ma'am, I'm, I'm sharing this with you. And the church just went, oh. they just, they, oh. collective took their breath away. And Pastor Robert was like, he didn't know what to think about that, so he just went in and preached his sermon. After he preached his sermon, he walked down off the platform, here come the pastor of the church. He's like, uh-oh, I wonder if I said something I shouldn't. He said, Pastor Robert, I want you to meet this elderly lady. And I want her to tell you her story. She said, I'll be glad to. She said, my husband and I were married for 42 years. And he was not a believer. And he died. I prayed every day that he would come to Christ. 42 years I prayed for him to be saved, to know this God that I know and that I love. And he refused, he refused, he refused, and he died. A month after he died, I get a phone call from a stranger. And the stranger asked for my husband. And I said, sir, I'm sorry to tell you, my husband is deceased. He died about a month ago, and the guy on the other end of the call got real quiet. He got really quiet. He goes, ma'am, uh, did your husband die like on this day a month ago, this particular day? And she says, well, yes, he did. He died in an automobile accident. And the gentleman said, did you talk to him that day? She said, no. We only talked at night. He was on the road. He was working, but I missed him. He never called that night, and I knew something was wrong. He said, ma'am, I got to tell you something. I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm a businessman, I wear a suit, I go to work downtown every day. But on this day, I just 
I had this overwhelming sense that I'm not supposed to be in my office. And so I got up and I was like, God, if I lost my mind, he said, I just felt the spirit of God lead me to be a hitchhiker that day. Now, some of you young people, hold on. Anybody? Hey. So we got some older people in the house. Who is that? That's fun. That's the funds. Hey. He said, I just felt like I was supposed to, in my suit, leave my office, go down to the highway, put out my thumb, and become a hitchhiker. And I thought I was losing my mind. Your husband picked me up. Your husband picked me up off the highway. I shared the gospel with him. He prayed to receive Christ as his Lord and his Savior. And ma'am, I'm calling to let you know that your husband is in heaven. So, 42 years she prayed for a miracle. And then Pastor Robert Morris made this statement. He said, yes, you did pray. But you prayed to the supreme ruler of the universe who is a merciful and compassionate God. Now, I don't know your situation, and you don't know mine completely. I don't know your health. I don't know the status of your marriage or your family or even really the vibe you get from church or what you're feeling about church, even this church. I don't know what the angst and the the pressures and the issues that you are dealing with, but I know who does. And the same God that raised Jesus from the dead, the same God who spoke the cosmos into existence, the God of Moses, the God of David, the God of Mary, the God of Jacob, Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Ruth, the God of Miriam, the God of Mary, the God of the Bible is the same God working miracles today. I see it. I see it in my own life. I see it in many of your lives. And I was praying with somebody just this morning, and they need a miracle from God. And only God can do this supernatural thing this couple needs. And I shared with them, and I'm sharing with me, and I'm going to share with all of us, and I'm going to pray. I can't figure the Lord out sometimes. He makes me a promise. He tells me to wait. He made you a promise. He's telling you to wait. It sure would make a whole lot more sense, God, in my brilliance, in my estimation, if you just did this right now. You know, if you just come on right now, fix it, Lord. Why don't you fix it, Lord? I heard a sermon the other day, the same God, you know, same God. God, where are you in my life? I've asked you, I am asking you, Lord, what is going on? Now, hear me closely. Hear me carefully. What you and I do next determines the true nature of our spirituality. Let me say it again. What you and I do between the time of getting a promise from God and God coming through on the promise, when we're in the wilderness, we're in no man's land, we're in the valley, we're in the pit, we're in the prison, we're in the difficult place, what do we do then, I believe, determines what we really believe to be true about God. If you're like me, you fail the test sometimes. You get impatient, you get fearful, you get worried, you get angry, you just get all messed up. Right, But God, if God is true to his word, and I know he is, he's going to come through. Father, we trust you today. We trust you at your word. You told us, Lord, come to me. All you that are heavy laden and burdened, I will give you rest. You tell us in your word, God is a 
help, a present help in time of trouble. So therefore, do not fear, I will help you. Casting all my cares upon you, God, because why? You care for me. Lord, I'm praying today for your people. I'm praying for our church, God. I'm praying for their pastor who needs it. God, we would walk by faith and we would trust you, Lord. We would trust the heart of God when we cannot see the hand of God due to our circumstances. Lord, thank you for preserving this amazing story. This story that looks so obscure, that we just read it so quickly, and to Petrus, Felix, what, who in the world are these people? Caesarea by the sea, what is this? But God, you are showing us through your word that just as you delivered Paul, got him safely to where you needed him, you are going to deliver us and get us safely to where you want us to be. And Lord, we have to trust you. I have to trust you. Maybe you're here today, friend, and you're listening in, and man, God has you in a good place right now. He's got you humble. He's got you quiet. He's got your attention. Let me encourage you with the word of God. Let me encourage you today to lean not on your own understanding, but trust in him, okay? For some of you, that is a big, big deal. You're a man's man. You're a woman's woman. You're going to figure it out, and come what may, you're going to make this thing work. You're headed for trouble. You got to trust the Lord. Rest in him. When he says act, now come on, y'all, let's act. But until he says act, let's wait, let's be patient, let's let God be God in our lives. Some of you listening today, and I know many of you are listening, those of you that are online, you don't have that relationship with the Lord. You don't have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. That can change today. I want it to change for you today. Here's how that works. You say, God, I'm a mess. I am very much in need of your help. And so, Lord, I'm asking you to save me today. Jesus, I believe it all. I believe you died on that cross for me. You arose from the dead. You're strong. You're awesome. You're the only Savior that can truly save. And I give you my life today. Today, March the 12th, 2023. Thank you, God, for saving my soul. This is a sacred time. We're going to stand in a moment. We're going to sing a song. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond to what you've heard. The invitation is an invitation to respond. Some of you need to respond by not singing, but just by praying and saying, Lord, you know, you know my hurt. God, I'm I'm faltering. Lord, I'm I'm on the brink of just giving up. God, thank you for speaking to my heart. And you just need to do business with the Lord, just you and the Lord. Draw a circle around your seat and you just talk to God. Others of you are like, no, no, no. I need help, man. I got to get up. I got to get out. I got to go public. I got to talk to somebody. You come. I know it's an... (laughs) I know we're an old-fashioned, multi-generational church that still does a public invitation. But you don't know why? I'm good with that. I love it. I love we got the old folks with the youngins. And we're sandpaper to one another. Holy Spirit is sanctifying Great Hills Baptist Church to be that church, that missional church that he wants us to be, where we get over ourselves, over our preferences, and over our demands to God and to everybody that will listen, and we surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Let God be God. Let him lead you. Let him direct you. I'm not sure what he wants you to do. But he has a plan. So I'm I'm pleading with you. I'm asking you, some of you would humble yourselves, lay aside your pride, walk down this aisle, talk to one of these pastors, one of these men or women of God. Now, most of our staff, I think probably most of them are gone. And I'm good with that too. They're out on mission. They're out on vacation. And they're serving the Lord and and enjoying themselves. But who we got left, we're going to pray with you. And we're going to give you our best. So, Father, we thank you for this moment, this precious time, Lord, of invitation. I'm praying, Lord, uh, I just ask you, when the amen is said that the purses don't rattle and the
keys. People start making their way out. Lord, I, I actually pray, Lord, they make their way down. Make their way down on their knees. Or draw a circle around where they are and just do business with you. Lord, I know I do. I know I need to do business with you, God. I need you. Never in my life, never in my ministry have I needed God more. Never needed you so much. So I'm trusting you, God, that you'd give me wisdom. You'd give me uh, strength. And God, give me courage to do what I know you've told me to do. So I'm praying for our people, and I'm asking you, Lord, to move. Jesus, we, we asked you to come, and you came Wednesday night. We sensed your presence by your spirit, and we're asking you to do that again in big church, in big Sunday, right here, right now. Would you move, Lord? Would you speak? And may we respond. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.